Well, good morning to everyone uh, here and, uh, and to, um, to the people who are following by the live stream. I have to say very sincerely that today I expected no one to show up to the talk because who wants to think about hell? You know, such a cheerful, cheerful um, topic. Um, so we pursue a series of lectures, um, talks, let's say, mapping the uh, issue or the question of uh, suffering and evil. Uh, and um, uh, we have seen a number of, uh, of kind of um, authors already. Uh, but I was very much looking forward to, to what we are going to touch today. Um, because, um, so hell, why, where does hell fit into uh, the mapping, the question of um, suffering and evil? Uh, it is because in many ways hell is evil inflicted on people by God, even if it is in the after death. And actually, is an evil inflicted on God in this life? Because how many people's lives are tortured by the thought of hell? Now, if there is a topic in which I really think that literature helps us to <coughs> interpret what the gospel says about hell in the way it should be interpreted, I think it's hell. Um, because uh, literature uh, or let's say authors understand how a text works, a literary text works. The Gospels are literary texts. So the way in which uh, literature in general um, deals with this particular topic, and it must be said that uh, uh, all throughout the centuries, uh, authors, secular authors, authors who are not believers, have been fascinated by the topic of hell. So if it was such a bad thing as we seem to think today, uh, it's very difficult to understand why this happened. But you know, let's, let's make a step at the time. So um, I gave you um, at the beginning of the handout a very, very uh, quick um, overview of hell in scripture. It's quite simple, in fact. So for most of the time, or for most of the Old Testament, there is no hell. There is no hell. There is no place of punishment. There is not even the idea that there is a punishment after death. There is only this idea that the real life, the only real life is life here on earth, and that uh, after death, there is no real life. There is kind of a shadowy existence, an existence that is in silence, an existence that, that it is a diminished existence. And one of the factors that makes it such a diminished existence is the fact that there is no possibility of relation. So uh, when, after we die, we cannot relate, we have a kind of a shadowy existence in a dark place, we cannot really relate to each other, and we cannot relate with God, we cannot worship God. So that's, that's the idea. So uh, the idea of most of the um, Old Testament is that uh, only this life really is real life. After death is not really um, a life. Then there has been a whole evolution in the thinking of, of, uh, and in religious imagination already in the Old Testament. Um, um, and uh, of course, for reasons of time, I'm not going to trace all the details. But um, where does hell as we know it come from? Well, number two in your handout, it comes from a physical place called the Valley of the Sons of Hinnon, which is, I think, to the south of Jerusalem, is a ravine, is a kind of a ravine, right? You say ravine or ravine? Ravine, right? Uh, very, very steep um, a kind of uh, walls, uh, no walls, like very steep kind of slopes. And uh, this place uh, was... Uh, known initially because of the worship of pagan gods. So this desecrated uh, the land. So um, a place where uh, kind of uh, idols had been worshipped usually was perceived as a desecration of the place. But also, and partly for this reason, it became a garbage dump. Uh, dump. <coughs> so, you know, this place where, where, you, where you put your garbage, you just throw it into that. Uh, and then... Uh, this, um, this, garbage, this, see, this garbage was disposed of by fire, okay, or by worms, you know, the natural kind of decomposition uh, of uh, organic um, material. Uh, hence the fire and the worms associated with the imagery of um, hell. 
And then it became the place in Jesus' time where the corpses of the people who had been crucified were also dumped. Okay? Uh, and there is very little from... Uh, so in the imagination of all the people in Jerusalem or in, uh, in, uh, in Jewish mentality at that time, there is this place uh, where, which is, you know, it, it's, it's probably the, the, you know, the worst place where you can go or where you can end up. Uh, um, and uh, associated with fire, associated with, um, with worms. So uh, the Jewish apocalyptic thought, um, when it tried to think about uh, uh, a punishment after death uh, or develop that idea, had no better image that you, know, you are going to end up in a place like that, okay? like this, um, uh, this garbage dump. So you have the passage in Isaiah 6, 6, 24, uh, in 2, 4. And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. For their worm shall not die, you see the image of the worms, and their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Now, uh, there are certainly references a number of references in the New Testament to um, uh, the afterlife um, to, and, and the place of punishment in the afterlife, which is called either Jehenna or Hell, as it's been translated into English with reference to this place I told you about, or uh, is uh, referred to by the using of the word Sheol, so the underworld, basically, of the um, Old Testament. So the passages are very well known in number four. Uh, so in Mark, uh, there is the, uh, the passage, you know, um, um, uh, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea, okay? And then, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. So you see the image of uh, fire. Um, then there is the parable of the talents. And again, at the end of this parable of the talents, what I have underlined, the people who uh, misuse or uh, refuse to take care of their talents are cast uh, um, into the outer darkness. So here is described as outer darkness. In the place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then there is a very famous, obviously, passage in Matthew 25 in which the Son of Man described in the final judgment uh, of Ma Michelangelo in the uh, 16th chapel, in which, you know, at the judgment, the last day, God will separate, you know, the goats from the sheep, um, the goats on the right, the sheep on the left, and, you know, and they will all, um, um, you know, those, and interesting, um, those who have not fed uh, the people in need have not visited the prisoners, etc., etc. The people who have not shown empathy um, uh, will, are the people who will go away into eternal punishment um, or, or the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then there is this uh, vignette of Lazarus, you know, the, the rich man and the poor man called Lazarus. Um, the rich men also died. They both die almost simultaneously. They were buried. <coughs> um, uh, so the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, so the image of torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and sent Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in this flame, okay? Imagine a flame, anguish, torment, etc., etc. And, uh, and you know the answer, you know, um, Abraham says, we cannot do this because there is a, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able to, and none may cross from there to here. But very interestingly, so you see, already we have two images or two ways of imagining the, um, the uh, afterlife, one the Sheol, diminished existence, one of punishment. But there is another, another way of approaching hell in the New Testament, which is 
not well um, referred to or known most of the time, but it is linked to um, uh, the Holy Saturday and uh, what happens between uh, the death of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection. So in the creed every, Saturday, every Sunday, I don't know if you noticed, we say that Jesus descended into hell. So what does he go to do to hell? Why does he go there? Uh, and there's been a whole tradition <coughs> called, um, in Christianity, called the harrowing of hell, uh, which starts from a passage in the first letter of Peter, which we find in number five, uh, in which it is said, you know, Christ died for a sin, and uh, having gone to the spirits who were in prison, he preached to those who were formerly disobedient. Um, and then it says, for this end, proclamation was made to the dead. So this passage contributed to the tradition, so-called harrowing of hell, which was developed especially in apocryphal writings. So these writings were, <coughs> you know, other gospels were not um, considered as part of scripture, but were immensely popular in the beginning of Christianity and the history of uh, Christianity. There is this very, very um, quaint uh, gospel of Nicodemus, uh, which, you know, has Miltonian kind of um, uh, resonances because uh, you have uh, Satan, Hades is personified, and there's a conversation between Satan, Satan and Hades, um, uh, the underworld, and then there is uh, basically Jesus, what Jesus does do uh, after he dies and before he's risen, he goes there, smashes absolutely everything, uh, chains the devil forever and empty, empties uh, Hades, empties hell. So brings everyone with him in, uh, um, in heaven. So uh, just the um, underlined passages, I quoted to you in number six a number of uh, passages from the Gospel of Nicodemus, but there is the, uh, the one that says, Then the King of Glory seized the chief satrap Satan by the head and delivered him to his angels and said, With iron chains, bind his hand and his feet and his neck and his mouth. And then further down, you know, is the famous icon of Jesus um, uh, going to take Adam and, and taking Adam by the hand and bringing him back to heaven, a very beautiful, and often the, the face of Jesus and the face of Adam are the same. They, they, they are portrayed in the same way. But it's interesting, I just underlined something in the passage here. Thereupon, Jesus brought them all out, everyone who is in, in hell. So if you go to 6.1, what is important about the Gospel of Nicodemus is that humans play no role at all in their ultimate salvation here. It doesn't mean that, you know, um, it's, not, it's not a way of saying, oh, what you do in life doesn't matter. But when it comes to whether or not you are ultimately uh, brought to heaven, this depends entirely on Jesus. Christ descends to hell and with a manifestation of his irresistible might, breaks its bars, smashes its bonds, subdues its forces and sets all people free gloriously triumphing over everything aligned against the divine creation and, uh, creator and his creation, which incidentally uh, is, um, is what is said in this passage in, um, and now it escapes me, I think it's 1 Corinthians, um, mm -hmm. where it is said that at the end of time, Jesus will, um, will uh, so everything will be, br is brought under Jesus' power, everything, everything. And then, uh, the end will be when Jesus uh, su uh, kind of submits everything to the Father, and the Father will be all in all. So what is, what is um, th you see, this image of hell is not a place of punishment, but it's a place, is yet another, another theater um, of God's might, of God's power. It's just a way of saying that even after death, even the place, uh, even if, you know, if we thought about a place of punishment of, of, or a prison or whatever that is, even there, the power of God in Christ reaches. 
And there are, there are there is this um, behind this there is this idea of it's basically a universalist tendency which is very, very strong in the Orthodox Church. So the idea that we don't know how, but God will save everyone. Everyone, okay? Um, and even if the Orthodoxy, it's never been defined doctrinally, but you know, the Orthodox, especially in the, in the um, uh, Latin Church and the churches that came out of it, especially in the Protestant Reformation, uh, have, this, uh, have always thought that you know, hell as a place of punishment is good for people. Uh, so we should not give it up. Uh, in the Eastern tradition, uh, there's been a tendency to say, it's not to undermine our responsibility and the weight of our actions, uh, but there is also the, the, the idea, this is trumped by the idea that uh, uh, it would be diminishing the power of God to think that anything can escape is mercy, anything can escape is transforming power. So this is very strong universalist um, tendency. So you see hell, to recapitulate, hell is often seen, number seven, uh, as a requirement of retributive justice. There has to be consequence, a punishment for evil and unrepentant people, especially if they seem to have suffered no consequences for the evil actions in their lives. Okay, don't worry if the evil people uh, seem to have a life in which you know they uh, they you know they are they commit all sort of evil things they take advantage of other people um, because they, they you know that time will come and then they will burn forever in hell okay uh, and this is very present in the mentality of the um, Old Testament okay the use of frightful imagery though fire warm darkness torment weeping gnashing of teeth um, um, unquenchable thirst is clearly metaphorical. It's clearly metaphorical, okay? And was not meant to be taken as a literal description of the afterlife, of course. Um, so and then you have this thing in Roman Catholic tradition of these saints with visions of hell and saw flames, etc., etc. And I remember this interview uh, of a theologian on, in, on TV, on Italian television, uh, who said, you know, but the, if these visionaries have seen hell in the forms of flame, uh, it means it must be true. And th th this theologian gave a very, what seems to me a very incredible um, uh, perceptive answer because he said, he said, you know, she saw, I can't remember the saint, it was a woman, she saw her hell. So what is hell for her? What, if she had to imagine what hell is, that is how. So it's not that even it granted that the vision was authentic, what she saw was not a, a description, was the way in which her senses or imagination processed it. We always process things through our imagination. It is a way... Um, now, that's the thing. So the use of hell, particularly in the passage of the New Testament, I quoted to you the talents, uh, the goats and the sheep, uh, Lazarus, etc., is it, is it a way of Jesus saying, oh, if you do evil, you're going to go to hell? Okay? Um, which is the way it has always been interpreted. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that because, uh, because you know, first of all, these passages are, um, you know, are very highly, again, metaphorical. They are, they are you know, uh, it's not a literal description. Of course, you know, the, there's going to be goat and sheep. There's not going to be... Um, you know, this chasm, um, hell and heaven are not, you know, there's going to be fire, there's not going to be teeth. Um, so so the, um, these descriptions are clearly uh, metaphorical, but they are a way of emphasizing the weight of our actions or inactions or omissions, especially with regards to whether we seek justice in this life, especially helping those in need. It is comparable to Jesus saying that whatever you have done or not done to people in need, it is done or not done to me. Okay? So when you help someone in need, you're not helping Jesus, you're helping that person. Okay? Uh, but Jesus says, it is as if you had done it to me, uh, as a way of emphasizing how important for him and for us and, uh, it is uh, that we should do this. So, they are, I mean, we should never forget, and this is why it is important to, <coughs> to dip into literature to understand scripture, that uh, the, 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 the scriptural texts are literary texts, 
and they use exactly the same strategies as any other literary text, text to convey an idea. And very often I think a theological or spiritual uh, um, kind of um, um, rendering or explanations are very literalist. They, they really don't understand, uh, or say a lot of the exaggerations come from the fact that they don't understand that these are novels. So these are like novels, like poetry, like, like literary texts. It doesn't mean that they are not true, but it, it means that they convey the truth in a way that doesn't mean that everything they say has to be taken literally. And then the theme of harrowing of hell sees hell not as a place of punishment, but as a way of stating how far the saving power of God goes. So not only you know, the passages where hell is represented as fire, punishment, etc., you know, we have to think about how, how they work. But it's not the only way in which hell is presented in Scripture. So hell in Scripture is presented in different ways. And there is one, one of the ways in which hell is not a place of punishment. Um, that's, that's how it is. Now, this is a very, very uh, short introduction. And is, um, so when we move to the literary tradition, uh, it's unbelievable how hell, uh, how popular hell is. <laughs> In a, in a, and in a, when you think that in Christian preaching, spirituality, etc., it's almost entirely disappeared, and for good reason, thank God. I mean, because if, if it has to be uh, as a way of uh, kind of uh, clubbing people, uh, guilting people into, into doing things, it's better that it's gone. Uh, although, although, I mean, yeah, in uh, evangelical circles, still is very, very, very present. But by and large, it is gone. Well, it, it, is, it, it is a pity. It is a pity because... Um, it has a value, it has a, it has a, um, uh, a purpose, it is part of the, and in any case, even if it is outside the discourse, it is present in the imagination. I mean, I would, I, I would like to ask to any of you, uh, I know the answer for myself, if ever in your life you have thought, um, what if it's true? What if I end up like kind of baking for the rest of my life, uh, for the, uh, you know, after I die, you know. Uh, I, I remember this priest, I mean, uh, who's, uh, who's, um, uh, but happens to be gay, uh, and, and, you know, and uh, I've um, um, made, made his peace with uh, whatever the, you know, um, the church thinks about, you know, whether it's a sinful condition, it's not a sinful condition, lives his life. But from time, he said to me, he's, he's elderly now, he said to me, um, uh, you know, <coughs> soon I, uh, I will die and then I will know. <laughs> I will know whether I, you know, my bet was, was a good bet or a bad bet, okay? <laughs> so, you know, there is, there is this kind of um, halo. Uh, there is this kind of, uh, because it's part of the imagery, imaginary of, uh, of a culture. Not only of a culture, it's present also in other cultures. Um, but I in our culture is that. Is, is, is kind of uh, baked into our imagination. Uh, and whether or not we talk about it is something that haunts us. And particularly in the moments of our lives, uh, it comes back, you know, what if? Um, and, you know, the fact that we, uh, you know, we send people to hell constantly. Don't we say it? We go to hell to people? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, our language does, does mean um, something. Or oh, this, my life is a hell. You know, it means that we have a reference, a point about this. In literary tradition, immensely popular, the idea of heroes, for instance, descending into, into the Hades or underworld or hell, uh, you know, the myth of Orpheus, Hercules, Odysseus, Aeneas, Dante in the Divine Comedy, of course, Harry Potter in the Deathly Hallows. It's a very, there's a very clever description of what punishment, eternal punishment and hell could look like for Voldemort uh, in the Deathly uh, Hallows, uh, in the Lord of Rings, etc. So it's something that is there, okay? And especially this idea of descent into hell, uh, and that things get interesting, serves not as a way of... Um, um, hell performs a role for this life. It is a metaphor, metaphor for inner transformation. Why people go to hell kind of uh, 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 go into this journey to hell to change their lives, to realize, praise God, 
to really realize um, you know, what, um, what is really important in the life. A journey into the unknown of the unconscious, and I'm in 11 too, the underworld represents inner fears and aspects of the self that are often hidden or denied. It is a rite of passage. It is a test of resilience and strength going to the underworld. It often brings the hero to confront mortality, gain wisdom, empathy, and new strength. So there is this text by um, uh, <coughs> Margaret Keane, yes, it's her, that says, the descent to hell where the journey down presumes the possibility of return is often presented as a trajectory by which the hero will be given knowledge to take back to his own life. Hmm? Uh, it is the testing nature of the journey through hell that matters and the reading is supposed to um, experience. So uh, if we go to uh, number 15, uh, while I think Christian preaching has often emphasized hell as a threat, a theme only marginally present in scripture, the literary tradition as a whole is much more insightful. Hell is for the living. It is about how it makes us feel. How does it make us feel to, uh, you know, the, to think about hell? It aims at allow allowing the reader to feel their way to hell and back. You know, we often talk in our lives about, you know, I've gone to hell and come back when we go through a, a difficult period. Now, uh, I come to James Joyce, um, so, you know, uh, the author barely uh, needs any introduction, is the most famous, probably, um, um, uh, author of the 20th century, uh, Ulysses and everything, uh, but his first um, uh, novel is a portrait of the artist as a young man. Uh, I read this book like 20, 20, 25 years ago, and I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea. Uh, I, I didn't read a uh, kind of synopsis before. So I, I, I was totally unsuspected, unsuspecting when I bumped into the pages of Description of Hell. I was alone in the night. Uh, in a, in a, I was staying in a, in, a, in a place very isolated in the countryside. Uh, and I was terrified. <laughs> I, I, I promise you, it was like... I, I, it's, it's so, like, captured and terrified at the same time. Um, and it took me, I mean, uh, the hangover lasted oh, probably for one week. I was like, you know, I really, I was afraid. Uh, I, I really kind of, it struck me as a threat. So I, um, so please be advised to be treated with caution. I, I uh, attached the, uh, the ex I, I extracts from the text in the appendix. And then I, and you know, this is so important because uh, in the novel, and he's a third of the novel, so it, 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 how brave and how interesting it is that Joyce would write a novel and a third of it would be a description of hell um, presented as a series of sermons by a Jesuit. So uh, the, the portrait of um, uh, this novel by, by Joyce traces his conversion, uh, the way in which he becomes an artist. How, what are the steps through which he becomes an artist? He's an Irish man. Uh, he was brought up in that intensely kind of guilt-ridden uh, spirituality. And what he describes in the novel is what actually happened, is that, you know, um, um, people, uh, children in schools or adolescents in schools were were kind of, um, uh, at one point, especially before confirmation, they would have these retreats. Uh, and one of, the the one of the themes of the retreat, or one day or two days of the retreat, was spent talking about hell and describing hell as, as kind of as graphically as possible to basically induce uh, fear in, in the poor uh, kind of uh, students who either laughed about it or took it seriously and then became neurotic. Uh, and, and a lot, and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, the um, the Irish kind of, um, with its uh, qu um, kind of qualities and 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 let's say um, dark sides, uh, is is really shaped by uh, this approach to spirituality. But the interesting thing is that in uh, in uh, in this novel, we do not have. Um, 
uh, Joyce going down to hell like Dante does, although it's, this is very modeled on, on uh, the Divine Comedy. He doesn't go to hell, but he feels hell. hell. He feels hell because he takes this, uh, these, obviously, he takes this uh, seriously, these sermons, is affected very, very strongly, uh, and he kind of precipitates into fear, into, uh, into um, agony, uh, into obsessive piety, he goes to confession, he does, he does the, um, the, um, the, the whole thing. And you know that this is a, a um, uh, and that's what literature does, is that it makes you experience, it makes you feel what the protagonist of this novel feels himself. So I did. I did feel it. Uh, now, you might not, it's not that you are necessarily to feel that you go to hell or you are destined for hell or hell is true. But, you know, it's, um, it's not just about being a spectator. Uh, what it does, what this novel do is that they really bring you in and make you, make you part of the, of the, of the uh, narrative. So if you go to 24, for instance, um, we see that um, Stephens does not simply picture health's flames in his mind's eye, but actually feels the flames on his body, his flesh shrunk together as if it felt the approach of the ra ravenous tongues, tongues of flames. So he, he, uh, he feels that. Or um, it just, not, you know, the, among the descriptions uh, of hell, the graphic description of hell, there was the boiling of brains uh, described by the preacher. And of him it is said, his brain was simmering and bubbling within the cracking tenement of the skull. Uh, so he really felt, you know, like psychologically that same, um, the same kind of feeling. And then he lives through his own future death. He, he himself, his body, to which he had yielded, was dying into the grave with it, nailed it down into a wooden box, the corpse. Okay? So he does not go to hell like Dante did, metaphorically, but he, uh, through these, uh, these very graphic sermons describing hell, um, he feels it psychologically, emotionally. Uh, this affects him very, very strongly. But it does not produce the effect desired by the preacher. Because first he goes into this guilt and, and um, kind of uh, uh, psychological torment, obsessive piety. And it's precisely the strength of this, of this kind of impact that opens his eyes. I mean, it, this is not how things are supposed to work. And this becomes the part of the process through which he understands what real art is. And here, I think we reach the, the kernel of the matter uh, in um, number 21. So Hell, in Joyce's novel, novel performs two important functions. First, it triggers a transformation of the main character's life. This is a watershed, okay? Although not in the way prescribed by the preacher's preaching strategy he was exposed to. The preaching strategy was that he should become an obedient uh, Catholic who should not kind of um, 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 go after girls and, you know, and should be very, very observant, etc., etc. Um, this is not what happens, uh, but his life is indeed transformed by the experience. And it plays the role of exemplifying improper art uh, and opens the way into the character's epiphany, into the nature of authentic art. So if you go to number 23, I'm going to take the second element, which is the one that really matters. What allows the spiritual liberation is the realization that this use of hell is a form of improper art. One could almost say a form of bad taste, okay? very bad taste. What makes it improper uh, is the fact that the response is prescribed, is predetermined. So it's, it's a really like, um, um, you know, however elaborate they are, 
However, from a literary viewpoint, of course, they are written by one of the greatest writers. So he based these, um, these um, pages on um, descriptions of hell by preachers of the previous century, a Jesuit, uh, very famous author, but reworked them uh, and made them into, into a text, you know, something that from a literary viewpoint is really, you know, is, is the writing of one of the greatest literary authors of the 20th century. Uh, so even if it is written the most exquisite like um, literary form, it is improper art. It, is, it, it exemplifies improper art. Uh, and why? Because it is meant by the, in the narrative to produce a reaction, which is that of what, wh whichever reaction, but a reaction that wants you to, to be moved in a certain direction. So art is there to move us, but it should never to be art, according to Joyce, predetermine in which way we have to move. He wants to, he is there to move us, but to move us uh, in the ways in which you know, we uh, sh should or want to, according to who we are. So, 23.2, the sermons on hell are meant to instill guilt, fear, make people to confess, and provocatively, Joyce, and jo Joyce, as you know, was a very provocative um, writer, um, says that they are just as explicit as pornography. This is a form of pornography because they are so graphic. Uh, but it's not just the graphic aspect of it. It's that, you know, they are meant to elicit a reaction, a certain reaction. Indeed, we see Joyce is reacting with terror, shame, confession, obsessive piety. But this impact cannot last because improper art does not change people. Because the reaction prescribed is not your reaction. It's the reaction someone else wants to get out of you. So it will not correspond to who you are. Um, and either is going to kind of, um, subs uh, kind of deteriorate into a kind of a, um, a, um, um, a caricature of piety, which is often the case, or you're going to get rid of it, or it's going to just deflate because it's not you, it doesn't come from you. On the contrary, proper art for Joyce, what he calls radiance, fascinates, okay? Doesn't overwhelm you, on the contrary, it is appeasing. It so diminishes your ego that you are in an almost transcendent rapture. You are really taken out of yourself in many ways. Uh, with the diminishing of the ego, you get a sense of release and your inner space opens out. You are not moved with desire. Des I mean, desire is important, but here is more like yearning or passion, what he, he means, or with fear or with loathing. You are simply held in an aesthetic arrest. This is the, um, the expression you use, by an enchantment of the heart, by an enchantment of the heart. So you know that you are in presence of real art when the reaction it elicits from you or it kind of... Uh, is not something which is prescribed, predetermined. It's something that uh, diminishes your ego. Uh, um, it is appeasing. Uh, it is, uh, you know, obviously these are images, an enchantment of the heart. Now, uh, the description of uh, what real art is in these pages is much, much more complex. There's a lot going on. But I, I for me, I think it was enough to stress this, this, this particular aspect of it, because I think that, uh, number 25, Joyce's definition of art or beauty describes how the good news of the gospel is supposed to work. Now, when we say gospel or good news, we are referring to a style of writing which was invented by Mark, essentially, uh, part of a tradition, um, to, uh, as the only way you could, uh, for them, uh, try to give a sense of who Jesus was and what salvation is. So it's not a biography, it's not a history, it's not a philosophy book, it's not, so, you know, there were a number of choices they could have made. They could have had a word-by-word -word, um, uh, kind of compilation of everything Jesus did. They didn't do this. They could have written a biography of Jesus. They didn't do this. 
They could have written a novel uh, about Jesus. They didn't do this. They could have written a phil philosophical treatise about Jesus' ideas. They didn't do this. They decided to take some of his words, some of his facts, and then put them together uh, and uh, with the use of a lot of imag imagery, using you know, the, um, the Old Testament, the images of the Old Testament, using uh, some of the cultural uh, imagery they, they, they had uh, at their disposition at that time, including the apocalyptic literature of, um, of, um, of that time in, uh, in Israel. So you see, they put all these strands together and they created something which is unique. And we have these four examples, you know, what we call the Gospels, but they are, a literary, they are literary artworks and they should be treated, they should be approached as we approach a novel, as we approach all other literary texts as works of art. And we should assume that they work like proper art works. So whenever, this, that's basically the, conclu the, the conclusion, the, 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 the point I'm trying to drive, whenever exposure to the gospel, to the Christian message, ex elicits or tries to elicit fear, guilt, obsessive piety, we know for sure that we are in the presence of bad taste in proper art. It's not the way in which these texts are supposed to be used. That is an adulterated version of the gospel. Or, you know, how many times have been exposed in some churches to a preaching that is, uh, wants to lead you then and there to commit your life to Jesus? You know, and then, you know, at the end of the sermon, you know, with the music going down and, you know, there is a kind of, uh, they last 45 minutes and then there is the music, etc., etc., and then uh, give your life to Jesus, give your life to Jesus. You know, of course it's a good thing to give your life to Jesus, but you cannot prescribe it then and there in this way. It doesn't work this way. It's more, uh, this is why the sacramental uh, kind of approach of a church like ours um, um, or most of a kind of Catholic Christianity is more the getting into that atmosphere, letting yourself to be uh, slowly kind of uh, um, let, let it slowly enchant your heart, fascinate you, uh, that uh, at one point is going to bring out a reaction out of you, but it comes from you. And nobody decides when this should happen. Nobody can prescribe it has to happen now. Now you have to give your life to Jesus. Okay? So, whenever the Christian message is presented in this way, it is bad taste. It is improper art. The Christian message, including the mentions of hell, because they are there, is presented properly only when it elicits a reaction similar to what Joyce describes um, as a proper art. That is, inner peace, enchantment of heart, and a sense of release. And, you know, I, we could quote many texts from the Old New Testament, but the most famous one, uh, obviously, is First John, especially for um, uh, the, the end of the passage, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears is not perfected in love. Okay? And this is something which is very strongly present in Christian spirituality. Um, so the idea that the infallible sign of uh, uh, what is defined as the devil's uh, influence, um, whether one believes is, you know, in, that the devil can be personified or not, but you know, the, the bad influence is that you feel trouble, you feel fear, you feel guilt, you feel all these kind of negative feelings. You know for sure that it is God's influence when uh, thoughts, uh, so, you know, the thoughts that accompany it produce in you peace, uh, producing you joy, producing you um, um, uh, tranquility and quiet in, uh, in the heart. So it's, it's not, uh, it's something which Christian tradition and spiritual tradition has understood. Okay? So you see, the case I'm trying to make is that if we want to understand the Gospels, uh, literary texts help us because they help us to see how they work. And when it comes to hell, the strange, interesting thing is that secular authors uh, have understood it much, much better 
than uh, what the role it, it's supposed to perform than a lot of the Christian preaching that has taken it, you know, in this literalist uh, way and uh, um, with this kind of prescriptive um, approach. So hell is nice, right? I mean, in the <laughs> end, <laughs> hell is about this life. Okay, let's uh, let's end with a prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the richness and the depth and the beauty of your message and your gospel. Help us to um, always be eager to get into its depth and be transformed by it. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.